just to uh, do the introductions, uh, Simon Lightfoot is a Professor of Politics and Pro Dean for Student Education at Leeds University. He's an expert on the politics of development of aid uh, and a National Teaching Fellow and also a former winner of the PSA's Bernard Crick Prize for Outstanding Teaching. Uh, and Simon's been writing for on uh, the online teaching experience in politics and IR for, I think, um, so he's, he's got a lot of experience under his belt. Uh, Simon Rofe is a reader in diplomatic studies uh, and international, uh, diplomatic and international studies at SOAS uh, and a reader uh, in, in that. Uh, his main area is on diplomacy and sport uh, and he's the inaugural director of their master's programme in global diplomacy, which is taught by distance learning. Um, Bella's gone through the housekeeping, so without further ado, over to Simon Simon to take us uh, on our journey. Off we go. Okay, so um, apologies to land this on everyone, but we've actually brought a, a fantastic new addition to the team. So I'm going to ask Helen Williams to introduce herself. So the three of us are going to do this presentation. So Helen, do you want to do, I don't know whether John will be able to do such a you know, you'll be able to do such an immodest version of John's <laughs> presentation, but Helen, can you just quickly introduce yourself? So, I, I'm afraid I, I jumped on the bandwagon a bit late, um, so I, I joined in on the Simon and Simon presentation here. I'm Helen Williams, I'm at the University of Nottingham, and I'm a teaching and learning specialist, um, and I particularly enjoy teaching statistics. Um, but I had a project a few years ago about assessment and feedback, which is what led to me joining this bandwagon. Welcome, Helen. Excellent to have you on board. Okay, so, um, yeah, so the three of us will work through. I'm going to take the few, the beginning, um, and hopefully everyone can see the presentation. Did I get Not that? yet. Not yet. Not yet. I haven't done the right thing then. So, oh no. Uh, <sighs> Well, Simon does, I'll just to say welcome and thank you to PSA and BISA for providing this opportunity. Um, it's great to see so many colleagues here. Um, excellent. So thank you for joining us. Simon. Okay, I might not be able to do the full on presentation, but it doesn't really matter. So um, we've been doing a lot of work around delivering of teaching, delivering of learning online. And one of the things that came out from the conversations between the three of us was this idea around assessment being the forgotten aspect. And again, hopefully today we can run through a few of the issues, some of the barriers for change, the fact that assessment needs to be baked in, not bolted on. And again, the um, making sure that we're there to um, also ensure that the students understand this and not forgetting feedback. So we, Simon had this um, cartoon, which I always think is quite nice in terms of the, the way that we see things in terms of we often deliver very exciting and innovative teaching and then we examine it through the standardized test. So what we thought we'd start off with is this um, brief, Menti to see if you can um, identify the barriers that you encounter with assessment design. So if you go to Menti and use that code, then hopefully we can um, capture some of the concerns of the BISA and PSA community in this space. Do I need to go? Everyone click on that. The QR code worked for me, so hopefully you might just be able to click through on that. It just says it's not open for voting yet. Oh, oh Simon. Oh, right. Demonstrating the challenges that we face and the barriers. Exactly, yeah. Uh, I'm going to move on. I can't. <laughs> yep, sent it. No, I can't do it. OK. 
okay i'm going to come back to that so i mean what we have identified is that there are and again we'll get interactive in a minute um we've been talking about this in terms of the what are the institutional barriers and one of the things that's come across in a number of different places and again it'd be useful to see if there's any um chat around this is what are the barriers and some of them are around the box on the form so you know if the form says essay or exam then that's what we tend to be um delivering to what extent are we open to the kinds of different types of assessment in politics and international relations we then start to see that challenge around program versus modular assessment and again you know what is the attitude towards the assessment how much does assessment seem to be a reflection of the learning outcomes or is the reflection around what we think is the appropriate support for students and then what are the costs associated with change in terms of us as individuals so you know we are facing the delivery of our modules online we're trying to work through all of that and then what are the costs associated with the change so um, what we were thinking about was the fact that we've got are we talking about the module learning outcomes to what extent are we talking about building skills and scaffolding what is the iterative assessment in terms of how do we create that learning process the assessment for learning rather than of learning and then this very buzzy word around authentic assessment so what are the tasks that students will do when they leave with an international relations or a politics degree or any of the other myriad combinations that we're in charge of and just again seeing how do those students prepare what does the assessment task allow them to do in terms of the delivery in the field and so we there's been a lot of research around this and again those of us of external examiners probably mentioned this as a sort of a stock element of our reports but you know could we be more creative but at the same time is more necessarily the good thing so in terms of providing opportunities, ensuring that students have different skill levels. I know from my own personal experience that we've done some very interesting things where we'll drop a really innovative assessment on students in their final year, semester two, and hope that they don't become too scared by that. So how do we, how do we develop across this? So what we're gonna do next is the fact that I can't seem to work a Menti code. We were going to try and identify from the community how we see what type of assessment tasks people use. And this is obviously an opportunity to try and post a few things on the chat. What, what we want is the honest approach. Which, is, which approaches do people use? Because then again, if we're using the chat, then hopefully we can start to build up that sense of asking questions and identifying from people what activities people do already and we can start to identify so i see the chat function hopefully is buzzing a bit now so are you going helen i was just trying to move you into slideshow mode. Um, I, I think we may have a Menti that will work that is not that one. Um, let me try this code. So we basically wanted to see that politics can be a, quite a conservative um, discipline. And we wanted to see what people, 
have experience of in terms of the assessment types that you actually use? Because there's a lot of disciplines. Um, so if you go to menti.com and you kind of type that in or you can stick something in the chat. So what, what kinds of more diverse assessments do you use that maybe move beyond the traditional coursework as recall of knowledge or again exam in a kind of timed environment where it's focused on the recall of knowledge and thinking about more applied skills or um, just more creative ways of doing things. Just to add in there, I think the demonstration we're pointing to is this uh, Goldilocks balance of, you know, not too much, not too little, but just right. And that's really the, the difficulty that we face um, in some senses. We're mindful of burdening students with too much overall assessment, too many different forms of assessment, which leaves them disorientated, but equally not uh, limiting them to just being good at developing one set of skills around you know the composition of an essay through three years of an undergraduate degree thinking about that diversity of assessment and really targeting it and building it through uh, the overall um, different levels of assessment that we see throughout it so using shorter assignments building out you know little confidence building measures as i've described them elsewhere about you know marks out of five doesn't have to be marks out of a hundred uh, you know that really does allow for us to um, use the full range of marks you know you can get you know a hundred percent it is possible um, you know things that we say as external examiners but actually we're not entirely uh, convinced and I think you know there's clearly some you know excellent experiences out there but where do we get the uh, points of friction you know i could uh, identify in you know good practice that i've seen as an external examiner where a diversity of assessment you know contradicts what you know people in you know who are largely here on this community because we care about it would suggest is good um, assessment so i think we need to just be mindful of that balance so how's the uh, answers coming through helen yeah, we've got some answers. I'm just trying to log into the correct account so that I can show them. <laughs> so, okay, here we go. I've got lots Thanks, Miranda. That's a good point. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen and show you what kind of answers people gave us. Um, so the most common um, types of assessments that people have used are some of the more traditional ones. Most people have experience with a coursework essay, essay exams and take home tests. Uh, a fair bit of experience with dissertations. But there's also a good number of people who are reporting that you use things like policy papers and presentations or poster presentations. And it's really encouraging to see the amount of growth in the area of reflective writing, because that's a really important way for students to grow and reflect on their learning process. So we want to uh, I wonder if we might ask Helen if the you know how that reflective writing practice manifests itself in different institutions and in different courses perhaps with different subject matter the degree to which students are engaged by the idea of reflection at least in my experience is you know, varied um, some of them find it you know hugely discomforting and you know really challenging but I wonder if there's some you know points that we might bring out in the chat or in conversation around how different subject matters and different the way reflection is located in different courses is it something that's trailed from the outset of you know day one of an undergraduate degree where does it arrive in the sort of assessment portfolio for students mm. yeah it's it's a really good point again is it something like simon lightfoot already mentioned where it's just thrown in in the final year where we go oh we should be more creative now here's here's a new type of writing which 
in my experience, students feel very uncomfortable with. So they've got their heads around this more objective style, but this kind of reflection and use of the word I can make people very uncomfortable. I wonder if anyone's got any uh, ideas around how the, the uh, you know, they've tr prepared students for reflective writing. Are there any top tips out there that the university's sector is providing to students to allow them to, you know, become better at reflective writing? Or indeed, you know, what have, have we as a, an organisation or two organisations and indeed as a community of practice, what have we done to improve our reflective um, writing skills? So we've got a comment from Miranda Melcher saying that she's introduced reflective writing from day one, having them read through the module outline and submit a few hundred words of what they're interested in and what they're nervous about. It's not marked, but it gets them used to the idea. And I think this is the thing, like we can do a lot with assessment and creative assessment if we introduce it from the start, because we're setting the kind of ground rules of, what our terms of normal are, what our expectations are. So if we are asking them to do that from day one, then they're more likely to get comfortable with it. Donna, absolutely. Students have to be taught how to do reflective learning. It's not something that a lot of people will just do. So Simon Roth, do you want to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think one of the, if we can pull up the slide, I think you've you got the slide pack still, Simon. Get to slide seven. Could what, or Helen? Yeah. Because all three of us try to do it, it'll definitely <laughs> break. But what we were trying to demonstrate here is that this variety of different assessment methods um, is something that needs to be as the slide suggests, you know, baked in and not bolted on. We need to keep um, that one, uh, keep this to be part of what we're um, trying to do from the outset. This speaks to the value of, you know, program level assessment, which we could talk about also. But if we might go just one or two slides back, Helen. I wanted to just share the, um, this sort of portfolio of different uh, assessment methods and by no means um, in the complete um, uh, view but this um, table gives an aside an assessment uh, of the different opportunities that there are out there and I think this is where if we were to be playing a sort of game of um, assessment bingo uh, many of us would want to you know sort of perhaps dab against all of these things as to, you know, reflecting the fact that we, you know, excited by, interested in, see the benefits of different uh, forms of assessment. But we wondered how this might look, you know, from your experiences across the, um, you know, uh, discipline. How many of these are, you know, realised in your institutions? How many of these are realised in courses you teach? Many of them are aspirations. Um, and things that you know colleagues in other modules do that you're a bit jealous of but actually how many of them are actually being deployed um, across the piece and just take a moment and you know tick as it were honestly which ones of these are really in play and perhaps contrast that with the uh, mentee which you know perhaps speaks to uh, what we'd like to uh, achieve um, you know from my own uh, perspective I'd like to do much of this but I probably even at my most ambitious would say that you know maybe 20-25% of these different methods are you know evident in you know the courses which I'm responsible for and particularly as a program uh, director that would be a um, you know a concern if you like. So I think in that sense, building out and making sure that you're scaffolding your assessments throughout the program, and particularly as we move into the online um, environment, is something that we've seen in you know, a number of different um, uh, ways come to bear in the last three or four months. Thanks, Tanya. Um, in terms of a, a photo essay, 
at least my interpretation, and I'd be happy to have others' um, viewpoint. So instead of building out a, na a narrative that in the form of words, actually different images, not just photographs, but images can provide that uh, essay. It may require also some um, verbiage, some lexicon by way of explanation, but by no means uh, uniquely. Um, in that sense, it reflects the sort of composition of a portfolio. But again, I'm, it's something that I've aspired to do. I've seen other people do that I haven't necessarily done myself. So for those, you know, if, if anyone here has experience of having done it, I'd be you know, delighted to hear more. Helen, um, I wonder if you might skip forward to just slide 10. Thank you. And the next one, sorry, lost, we've gained one. Just to provide a little bit of um, intellectual uh, reflection, if you like, a little bit of context. In my own work, I've seen this very much built out of the Salmon, uh, Jilly Salmon's model of uh, online pedagogy, and particularly the scaffolding that comes is implicit to that. And we can talk about the, that a little bit further it, it, it later. But I want to give um, the opportunity to talk a little about the, the F word, um, which is our next slide. Helen, are you going to run with this one? Yeah, I'm just having a slight delay in it responding to me moving between slides. Um, so the F word, how to maximize feedback opportunities. So it's not just the assessment that we shouldn't bolt on at the end. So we, we're kind of advocating design the whole learning process together and that it's really important to think holistically, not just, okay, here's the content that we're teaching. Now let's get to the end and assess it. Um, but to think about not only what we teach, what we assess, but the process of feedback within that. And feedback doesn't just mean the summative stuff that we deliver to students at the end in written form, which they may or may not read. And of course, in the past, we always had stories about stacks of uncollected essays where we would lovingly craft some feedback and then you know we'd have this whole pile of stuff that would go to the shredder at the end of every year about this time that we'd all be queuing at the shredder um but there are ways of kind of rejigging the way that we engage with the feedback and assessment process that actually gets the students to pick up that feedback more and and to engage with it and sometimes that's a really painful process so we want to incentivize their engagement with this. Um, so one thing that you could do, for example, is to incorporate peer feedback opportunities. Tools like Turnitin actually have a peer review system built into it. Um, Moodle has its own native system. I think a lot of VLEs have systems that already exist in there um, where you can set up a kind of safe environment for them to review each other. They can have double blind where neither of them knows who's reviewing so that it feels a little bit safer to them. Um, but I would say when you do peer reviewing activities, it's really important to craft questions in a developmental way and never to have them award each other a mark because it should be about helping them to identify areas for improvement, giving each other qualitative feedback, seeing what different writing looks like, but I think one of the lessons is you shouldn't ask them to give each other a mark because that can be really damaging to the process of engaging with feedback. And of course, they could be wildly wrong. Um, but there's also really simple activities like assessing a sample of something against the marking criteria. So Simon Asherwood was mentioning in the chat that students, especially from other disciplines, might feel really uncomfortable um, with approaching what he's asking them to do in politics and one of the ways that we can do is is just of course to look at examples what are we talking about what are we looking for and talk through it and sometimes that process of dialogue can really help students to understand what our expectations are and to give them the opportunity to engage with that process more 
um, but it can feel a lot safer because they're not critiquing themselves, they're not critiquing your work, it's this kind of third party that they can feel more able to ask questions about things. Um, but we can also incorporate opportunities for self-reflection engagement with feedback dialogue into the way that we build assessment. Uh, so for example, if I can get the slide to progress again. There we go. Um, so some of the example questions that I use for peer mark activities are things like summarize the main argument. And I talk them through these activities. So I, I actually give them references to a few pieces of academic literature. Why am I making them review each other? And the reason is because they often learn more from reviewing each other than they do from anything that we write to them. Because it's looking at someone else's work through that critical lens that actually activates their learning more. So I tell them, I ask you to summarize someone's main argument because if the feedback that you get from someone is that they don't know what your main argument is, then that's a good clue that you probably need to go and clarify that. But at the same time, it's maybe a little bit less contentious than some of the other questions that we can ask or things like what were the main sections of the structure, identifying one thing that someone did well and one thing that they could improve. In terms of reflection, I then make them incorporate this into their assessed feedback. So I actually ask students how they have changed what they've submitted for their large summative assessment based on the feedback that they got from me or from their peers. And that this is always worth about 10% of their module mark on the modules where I do this, and I do this at level one, I do it at level three, um, of getting them to actually think about what feedback did I receive and what did I change. And this makes a massive difference because it actually rewards those students who work really hard and they might not achieve first class work, but they did work jolly hard and they did learn a lot. And I want to reward that process of learning because that's actually really important for the long term. Um, and then I also try to make the feedback more dialogic in terms of giving them the opportunities to tell me what do they want to know. So I let them ask me up to three things that they want feedback on and three things that they don't want feedback on. And that just, without removing the anonymity of our marking processes, it allows it to be a lot more dialogic of some students really want to engage in that dialogue about the topic that they're writing about but other students what they're more interested in is the mechanics and they just want to know is my argument clear is my structure clear they they're looking 100 percent for the transferable feedback they really couldn't care less about the topical feedback and what i found is giving them the opportunity to specify this actually increases the likelihood that they pick up and read and engage with the feedback that I write. So, anyone want to jump in with some wrapping up or questions or discussion? Thanks, Helen. That was really uh, great. I wonder if so we can open up now for the next uh, half an hour or so to questions from the chat, um, comments, everyone can uh, chip in, see what we've got, uh, thought for um, prompting uh, possibilities of doing this elsewhere. How about, we could go. <laughs> Can we go back a slide? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Andy. John. So we, we asked for, yeah, we asked for some questions to come through on the, on the uh, chat. Um, so if, if people want to post questions there, uh, that'd be helpful. The one, one thing, a couple of questions did come through. I think um, you addressed the issue of what a photo essay was. Uh, there was also the question raised of uh, what a software exam is. Helen answered that on the chat, but I wondered if, if Helen, you wanted to talk a little bit more about that, about a software yeah, so one of my colleagues uses a software exam on a um, data module 
And the reason that they do that is to encourage student attendance and engagement with the material. Um, so we know that some students are really inspired to learn by having an exam that they know they have to perform on. And what this colleague found was that attendance was much higher and didn't suffer the same kinds of drop-offs when they had this software exam that was about two thirds the way through the module where it wasn't meant to be difficult. There were no trick questions on it, but it was literally, can you kind of produce the kind of data analysis that we've been teaching you to do over the last few weeks? Um, and so it's just one way of essentially manipulating student behavior by the assessment regime that we set up. Okay, um, Simon. One of the um, one of the questions or one of the chat comments was about um, I think it's from Natalie, and I think that's that's been interesting. I've seen it work really well in some institutions where colleagues have almost done it like a reply to reviewers. So students submit a draft, they then give some comments, and then the students have to integrate that into their um, into their assessment and what was fascinating was how you know even across a group of 20 students when this was done in a few years ago which students took opportunities to get feedback from the marker and and that's prompted some interesting things that we also have to bear in mind is how do we teach students to use feedback so helen's excellent slides are really important about that because students approach feedback in be the same way that we approach reviewer two as a sector that they always feel as if we don't understand what they mean we're really concerned about the way they come across and so I think that's something that I hadn't really reflected on until quite recently was actually how do we teach people students to use feedback so Helen's slides have given me quite a lot of food for thought around that there's a question about online delivery. I don't know, Simon, that's much, it's much more in your field. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add around that. Um, yeah, thank, thanks, Dono. I think the um, any types of assessment on or, or types of online assessment that disadvantage students. I'm, as it were, um, you know, a convert to online assessment as a whole, but I'm always mindful that some in that does provide some um, challenges too. So I think we do have to recognize some of the accessibility issues, but that might be simply just not having uh, access to, you know, high speed uh, broadband, um, you know, which is a problem that is not unique to students, um, but it's something that we do need to think about in the way we design our assessments. Sometimes, you know, very flashy, whiz bang, lots of, you know, moving parts kind of uh, assessments do require a burden on students that they may not have access to, particularly students from disadvantaged uh, backgrounds, students um, typically, um, you know, with other, um, you know, uh, special characteristics. So we do need to think about that. I think students have, um, generally within uh, disabled and uh, particular needs benefited from online assessments particularly in the sense of uh, uh, asynchronous nature of them you know the pressure that students feel to perform uh, at a particular time um, is something that many um, students find utterly overwhelming and we know from um, well-being cases and student referrals that we are actually you know very uh, much challenged uh, as a sector in that regard. So being able to take assessment and do it in one's own time to a point within a window of maybe 24, 48 hours, um, that's actually, you know, there's a good degree of evidence that that's really helped students um, from, uh, with disabilities, um, be they physical learning disabilities. And indeed, students who might not be able to access, um, you know, a particular uh, exam hall at a particular time and place. So I think there are actually positive opportunities that online assessment brings to um, 
disadvantaged students of, of all sorts. I think I'll pick up on um, Stephen Thornton's question about what makes an assessment authentic, um, which is a very good question, Stephen, not least because I haven't got a short answer for it. Um, if I might offer a, a quick uh, response, I think what makes an assessment authentic is aligning it with uh, the learning outcomes for a module and the subject matter so that there is a that sort of Goldilocks balance, as I suggest, between what, what assessment is appropriate and what is feasible and pragmatic. I'm sure that in our um, you know, uh, pedagogic fantasies, such as they are, we could design the most attuned, brilliant uh, piece of assessment. But if it's not practical for the student and for you know, the nature of a, the institution, be that because it's you know, 50 minutes worth of lecture or you know, a three week period in the summer when assessment has to happen, then actually it's not authentic. It might be brilliant, but until you can align it with the practicalities, rather like we do with our research, you know, it's not authentic, but um, I over offer that up as something of a provocation. Simon, a couple of questions that kind of went up earlier and I just come in on, uh, you may want to answer. Um, Rania asked about portfolios. Uh, what sort of assess, you know, using portfolio as a time, type of assessment. What sort of tasks and modules would that be sort of most appropriate in? How might that be used? Um, I think, again, I've seen them used in political theory modules where you put forward a portfolio of how different thinkers will see a particular topic. I've seen it used in a whole variety of places. So it's, um, and a portfolio can also be a way of bringing together the tasks so you know you could have a portfolio of a presentation and um, a draft and a policy brief for example and you could put all of that together and it's worth you know the mark on the module because one of the things that there's been a little bit of chat about which has been really interesting is about um, you know over assessment under assessment and at Leeds we made quite a big shift away from over assessing our students which for some students created a risk because they fed back that that was a one strike only policy so you only had one go whereas if you've got two essays both were 50 percent you've got a bit of a safety net so that was really interesting all i would say without saying that simon uh, my view on authentic assessment is i like to see that around tasks that students will do when they leave so the kind of report writing, policy briefs, those types of things, writing blogs, things that are really, really interesting because the students have to be able to engage with both the academic and the, the, the way to communicate. And as we all know, writing 400 words is sometimes harder than writing 4,000. So I think that's a really key skill. So that would be part of my view around the authentic. And that was where I raised the graduate outcomes. I mean, all of our students are asked, what skills do you gain from your degree? And we have to surface these things. We have to surface the types of work that they're doing, the critical reflection, et cetera. And I think that's again where Helen's um, work really helps students understand the skills that they're getting. I mean, there was an interesting question for Helen a bit further back in the chat, I think from Lawrence about students losing. Yeah, um, the novelty factor. Yeah. Has and again, yeah. And I, 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 mean, I, I haven't had a problem with this myself, but I have seen mixed results and I think it depends on the extent to which the person tends to actually feed back about the things the students identified. So sometimes I've seen students, when I've been kind of moderating other teachers on my own modules, um, where students have specified what they wanted feedback about, and what they got in response was a very generic sentence that didn't really engage in that dialogic process. And I think if they experienced that a lot, that would be one thing that would make them stop engaging with that. Um, I also provide very specific examples when I ask them 
what do you want to know about? And I do it in the module context. So I go, for example, I could provide you feedback about this, this, and this, um, to because they don't necessarily know what they want. I'm doing a piece with a colleague at the moment trying to analyze 800 of these submissions to see what the trends are and what students ask about. Um, the general trends seem to be international students are much more likely to ask for feedback on things like grammar and punctuation, whereas home students really don't want to know about it. Um, students at level one are much more likely to ask for things about transferable skills, how to write better in general, whereas students at level three who are choosing optional modules that they're more passionate about are much more likely to be asking me for feedback on a particular topic and they might be using my module to feed into a dissertation. So they really want help building their reading lists or things like that. Um, but it's also, for, for us, it's optional and some students don't fill in that section. But in my experience, most of my students do. Uh, okay, so going down to scaling peer feedback. So this is where I use the tools within Turnitin. So I, I use the Turnitin system personally, just because I've been using it for a few years. And I'm running it on modules of 250 students. Um, I give them the marks for doing it. So it, and it's very small marks. It's like 5% of their module mark. It's just to inspire them to, to undertake the peer review process, which can be really uncomfortable. So it's basically free marks for doing it. Um, and I tell them to let me know if there's anything abusive that they receive in return. And I've had one case in around 1500 students now, where someone reported the feedback and said this is really inappropriate and then I followed it up. Um, so I, I think it is actually a lot more scalable than people think. And I think we also have to be willing to let go of some of the control of the process and, and trust that the students will do this and, and kind of they'll rise to the responsibility essentially of giving them this opportunity. And I should say that's on first year compulsory module as well as third year. Helen or all Simons. Um, the, another couple of questions came up, which I don't think we've answered yet about choice. Um, Tanya and Natalia asked, uh, um, sorry, Natalie asked, asked questions. I think first of all about, um, can you give some tips on sort of uh, giving students choice and some of the issues around that? Uh, and is it a good thing? And what can you gain by, by giving students a choice of how they're assessed? But also the question coming up, does that then, present problems in terms of moderation. Uh, if you've got students doing significantly different things, how do you ensure that you're marking fairly and consistently across those uh, different types of assessment? I think probably the easiest way to do that is through portfolios and having students complete a series of tasks over the semester, but then they choose a selection of those to submit to their portfolio. And that basically gives them the freedom to do different assessment tasks, to pick which ones they think are the best, but to use a, a certain set of marking criteria and expectations. I just add, add in there, I think the, the notion of, of choice um, for assessments is something that students also need to be provided with um, you know, guidance on. You know, they might like the idea of you know, not doing an exam and writing an essay, um, but actually sometimes these things may not, um, and this sounds, you know, is always in danger of sounding rather patronizing. So I, I give you that health warning is, actually that might not necessarily be the skill set they need to develop. It might not be in their best interest. Actually sometimes providing the, the challenging piece of assessment is the most rewarding one. And in some senses we would, you know, like to see our students do those challenging pieces of assessment not just stick to their their comfort zone so we have to think about ways to incentivize them to do that and therefore you know having a portfolio where you know there are 
half a dozen different bits of uh, assessment and you only are, um, submit three, as it were, that actually provides you with you know, a, a gateway exercise, if you like. Because also in itself, that requires students to provide some analytical um, qualities to their thinking. What do, they, what do they think best marries up with the learning outcomes of a particular module or program? Equally, coming at it from another point of view as an external examiner, when you're looking at a module which has a variety of assessment methods, being able to you know, refer back to the learning outcomes is very much you know, the, the, it's sort of in some senses, it's the only way you can do it, in, in my experience at least. I'm happy to hear others, of course. Um, but actually, by referencing, is this piece of assessment in line with the um, assessment uh, learning outcomes for the module? It might be different from the next piece of assessment, but it is in line with the learning outcomes for the module and, you know, built up against the uh, assessment criteria that um, we're looking to. So I think it's entirely possible to um, you know, utilize different forms of assessment within a single module and within a, you know, a program as a whole. But one does need to provide the guidance and the framework that means that students understand the predicament and indeed colleagues, uh, external examiners um, and exam boards. Does that help? Okay. Yes, yes, that's, I think that, well, I wasn't on us. <laughs> I, I, I was merely the uh, intermediary, but I hope that helps uh, those who asked the question. I think that's a very, very helpful answer. Um, have we got any more questions anyone wants to, to ask here? Um, I think if, if I can just sort of uh, take, take the privilege to ask uh, a question of you. It, in terms of the move online, you know, obviously COVID-19 has come along, we've all had to move online. Have, has there been anything in this period of, of assessment moving rapidly online that has surprised you or you've learned in the last sort of month or so um, that, that's really kind of in any way sort of shaped or changed or um, influenced your sort of your bigger thoughts about uh, assessment? I'm happy to, to, to speak to that initially. I think mm. my, my experience, and this is conditioned by the, the circumstances we have at SOAS, um, you know, the pivot to online has been you know, largely successful. Colleagues have bought into it across you know, our field and others. And I'm, I'm you know, impressed by that to a degree that I was perhaps sceptical previously. So I think that's the sort of broader picture. I think colleagues have, there's a, there's a tension between colleagues broadly who are willing to give something a go and colleagues who in some senses, and with all due respect, want to be told what to do. And I think in that tension I've seen play out in terms of, you know, well, which bit of software should we use? Well, you know, my individual opinion, you know, whatever we've got, because we're not gonna be in a position to buy something new just like that and because we can make the best of it. So I think there's a, you know, as an example of how that tension plays out, the here's what we've got, let's see what we can do, let's take a risk with it. Um, and having just come from a, an exam board today, the external examiners and our exams assessment office being, you know, really quite robust about, you know, this, this was the best outcome you could come arrive at under these circumstances. And, you know, the, it is consistent, it is fair, and the students were given, you know, sufficient uh, forewarning of its occurrence. You know, um, with policies around, um, you know, mitigation, etc. I think we are in a, you know, strong position. Um, I've been quite impressed and, you know, being part of, you know, not least this series, but um, following a, a, a raft of, colleagues on this subject in the last three or four months I've been uh, enlightened certainly and um, reinforced that you know an alter alternative forms of assessment and indeed not really considering them alternative just forms of assessment that are appropriate it's perhaps less trips off the tongue less easily but nonetheless is you know what we need to do my two pennies worth 
Thank yeah, you. Yeah, and a couple of Helen, more. I think is that, there's a really important. Helen's got a really interesting reply, actually, or point about academic integrity. So, yeah, I think it's really important to think about the impact of what we're doing on academic integrity. How can we mitigate against people just being able to purchase stuff online? And that's it's part of a broader picture, of course, but it it just kind of feeds into that. Um, with moving everything online would students be able to purchase a reasonable submission for what we're asking them to do because if we start doing more creative things it actually gets a lot harder for them to go to essay mills and download yet another political theory essay which probably these days only costs about 25 quid um, which they can lightly edit and submit so I think the, the kind of diversity and the creativity can actually play really well into this, but it's also about that authenticity, that the more we make them do authentic assessments, policy briefs, things that have real world impact, it's a lot harder for someone who's stereotypically sitting in their parents' basement, say, and, and whacking out these essays. It's going to be a lot harder for them to produce things like that. So I think we need to actually take proactive steps to harness this opportunity and to prevent widespread academic misconduct. But I think we also need to think about, um, I know for certain disabilities, take home exams have been an absolute disaster. So we had one student who didn't sleep for five days because they had five days to do the take home exam. And it just created this extraordinary level of stress that they couldn't switch off during that entire period. Um, but we've also been thinking about in terms of pandemic disruptions and likelihood of illnesses and all of this of having more low stakes assessments. So more switching to things like portfolios. How can you make sure that a student will still be able to progress if they happen to be ill for a two week, three week, four week period during the term, but have otherwise actually made really good progress? Like we don't want to end up with a third of our students doing resets every summer as a consequence. Okay, we're just we're coming towards the end of the hour now. Um, the final thoughts uh, slide that you've just uh, put up. Um, I just wonder if you just want to, uh, one of uh, Helen or Simon, Simon, uh, want to just talk through your final thoughts just uh, before we wrap up. I suppose I wrote these, which were the, and again, it's a bit like Vicky has just posted in the chat that you know we are do we owe it to our students in a way to obviously allow them to articulate the skills they gain to this is definitely not to say there's no merit in a four thousand word essay or a three hour exam but if that's all you're doing it then then that does become difficult if you're then moving into a world where you're going to be writing shorter policy briefs or reports or executive summaries i mean i've seen people use executive summaries and everyone's really nervous about the fact that it's a 500 word assessment so that point about the graduate outcomes is really important there was some bit around the PEP and just the sort of regulatory environment around sort of making sure that we're able to demonstrate the again it feels very strategic but the benefit of a social science degree or a politics degree is something that we need to be able to communicate across to various different students and obviously we're working in this current environment people have touched upon it quite a lot so but I think it is that point is that this isn't something that would be what we were doing because of Covid it's something that we were doing and we were working towards in lots of different places it's just now Covid has made it more necessary so you know the top tips that we all need to think about and again it reflects some of the chat in the you know which has been really excellent and one of the great things about zoom i've just found out is you can actually copy all of the chat and then i can paste it so we can try and identify some points and write them up but you know thinking about whether you should be doing all of this in one module or across a program and again that allows you to think about the diversity diversity doesn't have to be in one module it can be across a program how you scaffold it so there was a bit of a chat a minute ago about students prefer doing presentations like this where they're talking behind a powerpoint so we can use that to perhaps structure it and move things on so that they can then sort of develop the confidence to then do a face-to-face -face presentation at some point but i think what 
particularly Simon and Helen have shown is how many benefits come from this thought about assessment and how you can integrate it in. And, you know, as a, every academic has to have, we have our further reading mm -hmm. guide. We need to update the iPad in terms of some of these things, John. So <laughs> yes, <laughs> put it on your, I'll put it on your to-do list, but you know, there's a lot of really good stuff out there. And again, like I said, it depends how people want to do it, but we can copy the chat and we can try and respond to some of the points. And obviously the presentation and the recording will be shared, but all three of us, if I'm speaking on behalf of all three of us, apologies, are happy to answer any questions offline. You can find us and email us. And again, there's really lots of exciting things that were mentioned and we can perhaps try and do this as a community. How are we going to support colleagues to do different things and to try out different assessments? Perhaps we can form a bit of a community that says, actually, I'd like to do this. Has anyone got any experience? And we can share that experience. OK, we're coming to the end, we're at the end now of our hour. Um, so a big thank you to Simon and Simon Helen for uh, taking us through that. It's been very helpful um, on assessment, but also thank you for uh, trying out some of these new technologies. I think, you know, something that, that we need to be able to do is, is sort of, you know, try things out in front of each other and, and, and work out how we use some of these uh, other technologies. So, so thank you for doing that. Um, you know, we're all working through these things. That's been a really helpful and fruitful discussion uh, and hope everyone has a good rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks, Simon. Well. Thanks Helen.